We have done a ton of testing on our analog radios and are planning on doing a whole lot more with the digital side. But before we get too deep into it, in this video, we're going to be talking about what digital voice is and the different protocols of operation. So let's get into it. We are probably all familiar with your traditional AM and FM transceivers that transmit an analog signal over the air. What we're going to get into in this video are digital voice transceivers, which convert the microphone audio to digital form, which then produces a digital stream of bits that goes out on the RF carrier. The analog to digital converter samples the analog waveform and turns it into digital bits, which the vocoder compresses into a compact digital format. From there, it is then sent to the modulator. So that's how things work on the transmitting radio side. On the receiver side, all of those same functions are happening, but in reverse order to recreate that original audio. Now, if you've used any sort of digital radio, you've probably immediately noticed some of the advantages that you get with it. Being that the digits are encoded at the originating radio, as long as the stream does not encounter errors, there is no degradation of the signal during transport. And with that, because you can infuse data into it, you can encode things like your GPS location, text messages, or even your call sign that can display almost like a caller ID. Oh, also, the digital voice signals take up less bandwidth in the frequency spectrum, so they are technically spectrally efficient, which allows for more radio channels to be supported. So that's really as far into the crazy technical stuff I'm going to get into. So let's get into some of the more practical understanding side of things. There are several formats that are commonly in use. So let's get into those, starting with D-Star or Digital Smart Technologies for Amateur Radio. And I'm just trying out a new ID-51. So D-Star was the first digital voice technology specifically made for ham radio and was developed by the Japan Amateur Radio League back in the late 1990s. D-Star sends 4,800 BPS to support simultaneous voice and data transmission digitized voice using 3,600 of that, and then having 1,200 BPS left for data transmission. ICOM then adopted this and promoted it, and then Kenwood started to make a couple of radios that also supported D-Star. Now, the original D-Star system did not include the concept of many stations getting together on one channel to talk mainly by using repeaters all over the world. So the amateur community created this capability called a reflector, and a reflector is basically a computer server sitting on the network that retransmits or reflects a transmitted signal to every, every repeater that is listening to that reflector. So this supports the common ham usage of many people gathering on a particular communication channel. Then in 2005, the European Telecommunications Standards Institute published the Commercial Digital Mobile Radio or DMR standard. Sound all right. Was that you come up with a zero before? Before I... DMR is probably the most common protocol out here and is a very robust commercial standard. And if you noticed, I keep saying commercial standard. DMR was not defined or developed with amateur radio in mind. Now, in the ham world, as far as digital goes, DMR is my go-to. And there are a lot of manufacturers that make DMR equipment. You know, I'm a Motorola guy, and they make some really good DMR radios with Hytera, Anytone, TYT, Redivis, and a whole lot more um, following suit. Now, I will admit, I know the most about DMR just because it is my go-to recreational digital mode. And it's also a little intriguing because DMR is the most unique protocol out there, mainly because the DMR standard was created, again, for commercial LAN mobile radio not amateur radio. So because of that, DMR does not support call signs and instead uses a unique number called a radio ID to tag each radio. Now what's good is, and what I like, is that the amateur radio community has embraced and adapted the radio ID approach 
to support call signs by creating a worldwide database that assigns a unique radio ID to a particular call sign. And with that, you know, a user's radio, you can load this, you know, to a table of radio ID. So the radio can display the call sign associated with the signal being heard. Again, because that digital coded bits coming across can have data attached to them. Now, DMR goes on even further to define three tiers of functionality, tier one, tier two, and tier three. But for amateur radio use, they're only using tier two. So if you see a tier two DMR radio, that's one that was meant for ham radio usage. And just for a little more clarification, your tier one products are for license-free use in the 446 megahertz band and provide, you know, mainly for low power commercial applications, which use a maximum of half a watt. Tier one radios have a limited number of channels and no use repeaters and have fixed antennas and your tier three stuff, that's gonna cover trunking operations. So another really cool thing about DMR is that DMR uses time division multiple access, TDMA, if you've ever seen that. And what that does is it creates two, communica two communication channels, which are your time slots, on one RF carrier. And what this means is that each time slot is 30 milliseconds long with one complete cycle lasting a total of 60 milliseconds. Radio is assigned to slot one, transmit and receive during that 30 millisecond time interval, and then radio is assigned to time slot two, use the other 30 second or 30 millisecond time interval, which basically boils down, and this is what's cool, is the fact that you are getting two channels on one frequency, which means that as a DMR repeater owner, you can support two sets of QSOs simultaneously while only acquiring one transmitter and one receiver. So you're really getting a you know two for one proposition here. Install one repeater and you're getting two channels out of it. it. It also uses color codes, which selects which repeater you are trying to access. And this is for if two repeaters happen to overlap in coverage, they would be giving a unique color code to avoid inter interference, almost more of like a, like a PL tone on the analog side. Now, a very important concept in DMR is the talk group, which for those of us in public safety, most likely all using Motorola's, this is the common you know, nomenclature that is used. And it remains a constant here in that it selects which group of users you are in radio contact with. For example, if, if on your local repeater, if you and your friends have a talk group, 100 programmed into your radios, then all you will hear is each other that are also on talk group 100, but not any other radio transmissions. Another group of repeaters or another group of users on that same repeater could choose talk group 101 for their communications and they would be hearing talk group 101 and not talk group 100. As far as the ham radio use for DMR, there are several networking systems that support DMR, including DMARC, DMR Plus, Brandmeister. I, I personally use the CMARC system regularly and I think it is absolutely awesome. Um, these systems have networked servers that connect multiple locations selected by which talk group you want to be in. These networks are very, very complex. Uh, essentially a collection of servers running network protocols that connects thousands of users running DMR radios. So as you can see, DMR is a very, very broad reaching, very powerful system to be a part of and be on. Then in 2013, Yesu, who is definitely one of the OGs of the ham world. That's what's up. Hell yeah. Respect the OG. So, um, and they make some really great radios. They introduced a third format, but this one was once again designed for, specifically for amateur use, and they call their, their protocol System Fusion. This mode is similar to DSTAR in that the voice data is combined with the data stream and that it can carry things like call signs, routing information, GPS coordinates, and short messages. Also similar to DSTAR reflectors, the you know, Yesu System Fusion provides a communication network called Wires X. And this supports a communication method called Rooms, which are similar to DSTAR reflectors, which allow for multiple ham operating. From QSOing with people, the general opinion I gather that is, you know, for most that have used both this and DSTAR, Fusion is preferred um, when you're trying to compare between the two. If you have any experience or thoughts on this, you know, is DSTAR better or is Fusion better? 
Let me know in the comments because I have not used either of those and would like to know why you feel that way. Can you raise the 11 and have a switch to 4, please? Now, the last digital protocol I'm going to get into is the one that I use both at work and with that Ranch Strategy uses operationally, and that is Project 25, aka P25. And what P25 is, is a set of standards developed by APCO or the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials International. And it was developed back in 1989 so that emergency responders could exchange critical communications across agencies and jurisdictions. It also goes on to specify the use of digital two-way radios, which are backward compatible with both analog wideband and narrowband radio. And this was a huge advantage because this meant that P25 radios could transmit voice and data to other P25 digital radios, but could also communicate with common analog radios. So these P25 radios are still the standard in public safety today. Another thing with these P25 radios and a lot of the DMR stuff as well is that they can be used with or without encryption. In you know, which case anyone, if you're not using encryption, anyone with a P25 compatible radio will be able to listen in and respond. So it's just nice for your higher security applications. They can very easily be set up to use the 56-bit data encryption standard, DES, or the 256-bit advanced encryption standard, AES. Now, here's one of the things about digital radio. With analog radios on a very basic level, if you're on the same frequency, you can talk to each other. This is not the case with digital radios. At a high level, digital radio formats do the same basic thing in that they use digital modulation to transmit voice signals over the air. However, these formats or protocols are different enough that they are incompatible. And this is where it is always nice to have ways within your comms plans to be able to default back to an analog FM, you know, mode when needed. As always, I hope you liked and got something out of this video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. It makes me feel like doing all this is not just a waste of time and is actually appreciate it. If you have any further info or questions about this stuff, leave it in the comments. I'm going to do some digital mode testing just for range and audio quality purposes. So get out there, train with your gear, let me know what you are utilizing for your comm setups. And with that, be safe.